Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you who have not seen me, hi. I'm a guy sitting behind a mic. <laughs> and for the skeptics out there, I don't have to use AI. I use the talent that God gave me. Anyway, I'm super excited for today's video, which is why I am doing an on-the-camera intro. Months ago, I asked all of the subscribers if they would like to turn in their own personal true story and you all didn't let me down <laughs> i have 50 pages worth of personal stories so i will do my best to read them in their entirety and of course acknowledge and give credit to the authors that turned it in so thank you all so much for doing that in the future we will be having a drawing for one of you lucky folks that sent in the stories because I know how long it takes to sit down and write out something the screw ups the start overs blah 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 trust me I would know anyway with all of that being said it is time to go back to ashes for once we arise from the ashes we are bigger brighter stronger and a happier person in the morning Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Subscriber Horror Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Jenny Daniels. This happened when I was about 15 to 16 years old. My mom, stepdad, sister, and I had gone on a long road trip from Florida to Michigan. On the way back, we planned to stay over a few nights in a state park in Tennessee. When we arrived, we checked in and went to our cabin, number 16. The cabins were on the side of a pretty large mountain, so it was extremely secluded. Also, our log cabin wasn't in a tight row beside two others, like most of the other cabins. It was off the beaten path and surrounded by lots of trees. The cabin was originally only one bedroom, a small bedroom, and a kitchen slash living area, plus a screened in porch. They had recently closed in the porch and made it into an open bedroom that was facing the kitchen. This provides some context for later. So my mom and stepdad took the original bedroom with the door, which seemed to have faulty lights as they turned off and on often for no reason. Not flickering, but fully off and on without the switch moving at all. Me and my sister took the open bedroom, which was freezing at all times of the day, even though it was the middle of the summer. We chalked this up to the fact that maybe because it used to be a porch, it wasn't as insulated as the rest of the house. Though this really wasn't logical because of the time of the year. The first night was when we started wondering if our simple explanations weren't going to be enough to ease our minds. Me and my sister woke up to mysterious banging in the night. It was pitch black as there were no lights on the mountain at all, but we could clearly hear loud banging coming from the kitchen, which was right in front of us. We were scared and didn't move, and eventually went back to sleep, hoping it was the wind. When we awoke, several of the kitchen cabinets were open when we were sure they'd been shut the night before, as we hadn't even touched them when we arrived. Apparently, my mom and stepdad had also heard the banging. We are all believers in the paranormal, and this is what we figured it must be. Throughout the day, several other odd occurrences happened. There were always water drips on the floor, even when we hadn't showered or used the sink. They always led from the kitchen to out of the front door. 
there would be intact drips underneath the screen door, as if it had been opened and someone dripping wet had walked through, even if it hadn't in hours. When it got dark, the bedroom lights started turning off and on repeatedly. We decided to ask someone, are you with us? And the light turned on. We thought maybe we could communicate with the light, so we started asking yes or no questions. If the answer was yes, flash the light. If no, leave them on. Through this, we found out she was a woman and wife, and because of the water, we started asking if she had drowned, in which she replied, yes. This state park had a gigantic dam and there were several deaths noted around it, so it did make sense. The last day we were there, we were all packing up the car and getting ready to leave. I saw a woman who I thought was my mom, wet from the shower, walk outside. I followed her to ask her if she needed help packing the bedroom, but she wasn't inside. I looked around and could not find her. I eventually went back inside, only to hear the shower running. I knocked on the door and asked my mom if she had come out, and she said she'd been in there for the last 15 minutes. I was so spooked, I refused to go back in the cabin and waited in the car until we left. We asked a ranger on our way out if he ever had complaints about any specific cabins being spooky or having electrical problems. And he said, oh yeah, sure, but she moves around too much to keep track. <laughs> Sugar Spite. I apologize for the long story. Boy, do I have a story for you. It may be hard to believe, but I swear on my life that it's 100% true. Here we go. Disclaimer, do not try this. My sister and I used to be thick as thieves back when we were kids, which meant that we hung out quite a bit and got into a ton of trouble together. I think that we were around 10 and 13, respectively. My sister being the eldest when this incident occurred. It was close to three in the morning and I couldn't sleep, so I snuck out of my room and quietly tiptoed down the hall to my sister's room. I had to be super quiet since our parents' room was right across the hall from hers. So I held my breath as I turned the doorknob and slipped into her room. To my surprise, my sister was also awake. The two of us sat there talking, whispering, so that we wouldn't wake up our parents. And we both had this feeling of, hmm, offness about that night. Now, my sister and I both are believers in the paranormal, as we'd both had previous experiences, so we decided to do the dumbest thing that we would end up regretting for the rest of our lives. We decided that it would be a great idea to try to contact any spirits lingering around the house. Normally, one would use a Ouija board or use spirit writing for contacting spirits. But since we didn't have anything like that, we settled for a deck of cards. The game started like this. First, you shuffle the cards 13 times, split the deck, 13 times, and then hold the card in your hand. Next, you place a finger on top of the deck and begin making circles on the card 13 times and ask, are there any spirits who wish to communicate with us tonight? Before tapping on the card. Once the question is asked, you flip over the top card, and if the suit is red, that means there's a spirit in the room. If the suit is black, the answer is no, and you try again. Once you reach a spirit, you start asking questions. We'd been doing it for so long, we lost track of time and hadn't realized that it was going on three o'clock in the morning. 
We were about to say goodbye when we heard the most bone-chilling screech outside of the bedroom window. All of the hair on my body stood at end, and we both suddenly felt extremely nauseous. Me, being the curious younger sister, decided to open the curtains and peer out. And believe me, I wished that never happened. The apparition we saw had long, wild black hair, black eyes, and very pale skin. The thing had something wrapped around its neck. I was able to choke back the scream that threatened to fall from my lips while my sister stood there frozen and looking almost as pale as this apparition. The thing screamed at us again as I finally came back to my senses, grabbed the deck of cards, performed the 13 circles, and tapped and said goodbye. To our immense relief, the apparition vanished. Suffice it to say, my sister and I were never able to go back to sleep that night, nor did we speak of it for years. I'd actually forgotten about it until years later, after I'd moved out and started living my own life. I'd gone home to visit my parents, and we'd gotten onto the topic of all the paranormal activity surrounding that house. When my dad mentioned seeing that exact place and the exact same apparition in the house, I turned several shades of pale, and when asked what was wrong, I told my parents about the incident years ago. My father told me that this apparition had come running towards him. He closed his eyes and began whispering prayers, and then he opened his eyes. It was gone. After that night, my father reassured me that he'd never see that particular thing again, whether it was a demonic entity or just a really pissed off apparition is anyone's guess. Ebony Wilson Story number one. Starting off with my earliest experience, my mom took me with her to lay flowers at a family grave one day. I was only a few years old. However, old you are when you still need a pram or buggy and kind of speak. When we got to the grave, apparently, I got very scared. My mom asked me what was wrong, and all I said was, Mom, I don't want to go down there, as in buried underground. How I know about death at that age, I don't know because I was not exposed to anything like that ever. Story number two. So, this one happened at a friend's house. We'll call her Jessie. Me and my other friend, uh, let's call her Amy, were sleeping over there. Jessie had a free house, so we ordered pizza and watched TV whilst chatting nonsense, as teenagers typically do. After food, we all went into the kitchen which faces directly into the living room with a wall and a door separating the two. The door was open so we could see through it. I was facing the living room and Jesse and Amy were talking to each other whilst I was just kind of staring off. Out of the ordinary, as clear as day, an old man with a walking stick starts slowly walking across the living room. Uh... He should not be here. But this isn't a man of the living variety. No, no, he is clearly from the afterlife. I don't know how to explain it, but he was moving slowly with his stick. But he also moved kind of fast as a whole. This makes no sense, right? I'm staring wide-eyed at this man. I know what I saw. It wasn't out of the corner of my eye, and we didn't do drugs or drink. So, I was 100% sober. My friends looked at me and said, What's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I was too stunned to speak, aside from saying, I think I just did. Once I'd come back to reality, I told them what I had seen, and they absolutely believed me. We were all super close, so we know when one another is either lying or pretending. They knew I wasn't from the look on my face. Oh, um, side note. Well, I hated the bedroom we all slept in because although the ceiling is really high, I had the feeling of pressure in the air the entire time, and it felt awful. I'm so glad we moved not long after that. Story number three. This one was when I was 16. I was staying over at my boyfriend's house. We'll call him Tyler. Tyler's parents were on holiday, so we had the house to ourselves. This led to us setting up camp in his living room on an air mattress, snacks, and good TV. Just the stress, same as the other story. We were both 100% sober. We were settling down to go to sleep, and the airbed was in the middle of the room, with an armchair behind our heads. All of a sudden, I feel this panic and unease, and somehow just knew we were being watched. I said this to Tyler, and he looked at me like I just spoke in ancient language. I explained it was just a feeling, but that someone is sitting in the armchair behind us. He got a bit uncomfortable, but reassured me, there's nothing there. So I tried to ignore the feeling, but not long after that, I got an image in my head of a man. I just knew that this was the being that was sitting behind us. I don't know how, I just knew. So I decided to describe this man to Tyler, his appearance, sense of humor, all down to the details. They were just coming to me. It sounds crazy, and if someone else told me this, I'd be skeptical too. So once I described the presence, I looked over to Tyler, and he was visibly emotional. He then told me I described his granddad exactly. He had passed away long before we'd ever met, and I've never seen a picture or been told about him my whole life. Safe to say Tyler went from being skeptical to 100% believing me. After this, the presence didn't feel scary, but comforting. As if I had relayed a message that he was with us and we'd met in a way and I got his approval. Tyler and I fell asleep after this with a warm feeling inside. I have so many more stories to share, but this is already long, so... I hope you all have enjoyed my stories. Cindy, Cleveland. Here is my story. I moved into these apartments in 2005. I was living, at the time, with my sister due to losing my job. My brother-in-law had ALS, and it was getting to be where he wouldn't be living much longer, and my sister wanted me out of here. The first year went by okay. I had to get a part-time job at night because I couldn't afford it with just my day job. After a while, I started hearing scratching in the walls. Found out we had rats. Called about it, but nothing was ever done to get rid of them. Finally, one night, I was sitting talking with a friend on the phone, and one actually ran across the floor in front of me. I screamed and scared the friend on the phone. In 2010, I started having trouble breathing and couldn't sleep in my bed. I thought I was getting asthma. On April 1st, 2011, I was at work and collapsed. I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I was in the hospital for two weeks. They were surprised I recovered so fast from it. My brothers and sister didn't want me to live alone, so we decided that I would move in with my sister. 
I went and talked to the apartment office, and they told me to send them a letter, and I did. I then went and signed the papers, which I had someone to go with me because I was still exhausted from being laid up for so long. My nephews, brother, and sister came to help me move. I just supervised them. They packed for me, too. But when my brother lifted the sofa up, all these rat turds fell out of it. Needless to say, the sofa went to the dump. Mm -mm -mm. Many months went by when I got a letter from the apartment charging me with all this crap, plus unpaid rent. Shortly after I got the letter, my wages started getting garnished. I freaked out. I called my nephew because my sister was out of town. He called their lawyer for me, but nothing got resolved, so I left with a small paycheck for many months. Many months go by when I got a letter from the apartment charging me with all this crap plus unpaid rent. Shortly after I got the letter, my wages started getting garnished. I was freaking the hell out. I called my nephew because my sister was out of it. He called their lawyer for me, but nothing got resolved. So I lived with a small paycheck for any months, and I was talking to a sister's sister-in-law about it because she was a landlord. She told me that these people are notorious slumlords and famous for doing this kind of crap. A year went by, and I got another garnishment from the same staff. This time, I called the lawyer and sent her the form I'd signed, and they ended up giving all of my money they had taken so far back to me. A couple of years later, a hurricane came through and flooded these apartments, and everyone had to move out. When they came in to assess the damage, they found out that these apartments were filled with asbestos. Everyone had to move out then and there. The apartments got sued. Poetic justice. I'm sorry for the long story, but I hope you enjoyed listening. Rosie Rose. This is something that I haven't told another person except for another friend of mine. This experience of mine isn't as horrifying as others, but regardless, it is still something that has stuck with me till now. A few years ago, back when I was around 15 or 16, my friend and I were followed by someone. My friend, who I will call friend A, and I were hanging out in town. To give better insight, we live in a very rural part of the southeastern U.S., where the towns are far in between, separated by tons of woods. It was night when my friend was driving me back home after a day of fun. Friend A had just passed two cars and turned onto another road when we noticed a car following dangerously close behind us. This section of the road we were on was desolate and dark, so we were already getting a little weirded out by it. Friend A decided to speed up, probably thinking the person was wanting to go faster but didn't want to pass. The person behind us sped up, nearly hitting the bumper of Friend A's car. This scared the shit out of us, but I realized that this car was one of the cars my friend had just passed. My friend, who was only two years older than me, was scared and sped up more to get some distance between us. This didn't work as the person following us sped up as well. I was trying to keep my cool and trying to keep my friend calm, but the situation had thoroughly freaked me out. I just knew this person didn't have any good intentions, and as two young teenage girls, my friend and I didn't know what to do. So my friend just started speeding down the road, getting up to 90 miles per hour, but this person was keeping up. I was worried that she was gonna lose control and wreck, and could only pray that we would remain safe. After like 15 minutes, 
I looked back and saw that the car was no longer behind us. Since we were a few minutes away from my house, my friend hurriedly got to my house and she stayed there for a bit before going back to hers. Now, I know there are many things we should have done, such as calling the cops, but in that situation we were too scared to think about that. I have a feeling that it was a case of road rage on that person's part, but I can't be sure. Whatever the reason, they scared my friend and I for life. I understand that my friend and I's experience was better than these in a similar predicament, but it was something so scary to experience. Especially if you don't know what the other person wants and you were on a desolate part of a road. Ever since this incident, I've always been weary of who is behind me when driving and if I'm riding with someone. I just can't get that night out of my head. Regardless, I'm glad I've been able to get this off my chest after so long. I never shared this, except for with my other friend, and fear that people would say it was my friend's fault or we must have been overreacting. My friend and I were pretty lucky since we only got scared and nothing else happened to us. But I know that there have been other cases where people weren't as lucky. So please stay safe out there, everyone, and always be wary of others both on and off the road. You just never know who you might encounter. Cindy, Cleveland. This happened back in 1986 when I was working for a bank in the bookkeeping department in Richmond, Virginia. Where I worked in bookkeeping was called statement rendering. We kept all the personal and corporate checks filed there. On the first and second of each month, we had to mail out by hand all of the corporate statements. Everyone in the department no matter your regular job, had to help that day, and we sometimes didn't get out until around 8 or 9 that night. Usually, we got an hour for lunch, but on those days, we got 30 minutes. I can't remember the exact day the story takes place, but it was in 1986, right after we bombed Libya. So, I am thinking April or May. My friend, M and I, were discussing what to do for lunch because, as I have stated before, we only had 30 minutes that day. We decided on going to Popeye's because it wasn't too far away and thought we could make it in 30 minutes. So that's what we did. My friend was driving because I didn't have a car at the time and took the bus everywhere. The bus system in Richmond was really good. We got to Popeye's and got in line to order. As we were standing there, a guy came in and got right behind us in line. He was staring a hole through me. I turned back around and stared straight ahead. M and I kind of looked at each other with a, what's wrong with this guy, kind of look. We got our food and went and sat down. M sat across from me and whispered that when I was going to sit down, that guy's eyes followed me the whole time I was walking back to the table. That's when I started getting worried. He came and sat down at the table behind ours, and I was facing him. The whole time, he just sat there and stared at me. I would try and sit so M's head was blocking his view of me but he just wound up moving over to continue to stare. We had to sit there and wait until he finally got up and left. After he got up and left, we started laughing about it, but the laughter didn't last long. He didn't leave. He was waiting for us in the parking lot in his car. As I stated before, it was right after we had bombed Libya. He looked Middle Eastern, and I started thinking we were going to be kidnapped. We decided to walk back to where the arcade games were, just to see if we were being paranoid. And we weren't. He drove over to where he knew we were. Now we started panicking. 
Our time for lunch was running out, and we didn't want this guy following us back to work. So we went to the payphone there. This was before cell phones, and called our office to let them know what was going on. Our boss was at lunch, so he had to leave a message. After that, we stood there trying to decide what to do to lose this guy. The parking lot just had one row of spaces, and there was an entrance out to the main street, and another one in the back going out to the parking lot, where there was a back way to work. By this time, he had pulled his car out and was facing the front entrance to the main road. I told my friend to back up and go out the other way through the parking lot, and we can go the back way to work. That's what we did. We saw him zoom out the front way and tried to find out which way we went, but he never did. We got back to work late and told them what had happened. They all burst out laughing and said it sounded like something out of Miami Vice. Then I burst out crying. My friend yelled at them that there was nothing funny about it. I have been wanting to get the story written down and thought the best opportunity was to share it with you all here on Back to Ashes. Tina Mead this happened back in 2014, when my oldest daughter was a junior in high school. She started playing the flute in the eighth grade, and I was so proud of her. She got so good at it that she joined the marching band once she got to high school, even switched to an advanced flute, and had first chair. So, when they asked for volunteers for band camp, I gladly went. Camp was about an hour away in Metamora, Michigan, which was basically a Boy Scout camp. So nice of them to let the band use it for practice. To give you a layout of our campsite, when we pulled up in the dirt parking lot, there was a huge field straight ahead of us. To the left of the field was the girls' cabin. To the right of the field was the boys' cabin. In the middle is where they met each morning under the pavilion to practice, which was all day, rain or shine, breaks every so often. Very grueling practice, let me tell you. It was not fun and games at band camp. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner was served up the hill to the left of the parking lot in the kitchen. I forget what they actually called it. So not only did they practice all day, but they had to climb a steep hill six times a day to eat. Boy, were my legs in great shape after that weekend. So, on with the story. We unpacked the truck, got ourselves set up in our cabins. Our cabin was actually pretty nice. It had a big open area when you first walked in, and a kitchen. A girls' and boys' bathroom with showers. The bunk beds were even pretty nice. The first night was uneventful, a little bit of practice, then dinner, then back to the cabins for free time and showers. That first night in the girls' showers was a little crazy. Girls everywhere, and I barely got to the sink to wash my face and brush my teeth. There were no boys in our cabin, and I wondered to myself why they weren't using the boys' bathroom as well. It was wide open. No one was in there. Then, I decided to start using that bathroom. It was awesome. Total privacy. Now that I think about it, that bathroom was a little off. I didn't really pay that much attention to it at the time, but when I went in there, it was like walking into a soundproof room. The air was a little heavier and totally quiet. It's kind of hard to explain, really. Bedtime came, and I decided to use the bathroom one more time before bed. I was sitting there doing my thing, and I heard this strange noise. I sat there for a minute and tried to concentrate on what I was hearing. It was a sound, like maybe really low whispering or hissing. I looked up at the ceiling and noticed there were pipes. So I brushed it off and thought it was just the pipes making that sound. Then I went to bed. The next morning, the same thing again, 
when I used the boys' bathroom, but a little louder this time. I paid it no mind as I thought it was the pipes again. We all went to breakfast, then to the field for practice, which was so much fun watching them go through their routine and every step having to be precise. I never knew so much went into what they do and just how much hard work went into it. Play an instrument, count your steps at the same time, and pay attention where you're supposed to be? That takes talent, if you ask me. Did you know when they go backwards, they have to be on their tippy toes? Sorry, I'm digressing. I decided about halfway through the practice, I was going to go back to the cabin and take a shower while no one was in there. I go back, get all of my shower stuff together, and head into the boys' bathroom. I set all of my stuff on the counter, put my shampoo, soap, etc. in the shower, and my towel within reach of the shower. I took my shower, got dressed, was standing at the mirror after brushing my teeth, brushing my hair back to pull into a ponytail. And I heard that noise again. I'm thinking that it must be the pipes yet again as I just took a shower. As I'm holding my hair and reaching up to put it into a ponytail, I hear, Hey, can you hear me? To the right and slightly behind me, like someone was leaning towards my shoulder and talking into my ear. I instantly froze. Every hair on my body was standing on end. I looked in the mirror to see if someone had come into the bathroom with me. No one. I almost decided to answer back. Yes, I can, but something told me not to. I grabbed all of my stuff off the counter and booked it so fast out of there. I have had strange things happen to me before. Since I was a kid, I have had what you call clairsentience. I can feel the presence of supernatural beings. I have had things move. I've been touched, but never have I had something speak to me. That shook me up pretty bad, and I avoided that bathroom for the rest of the weekend. And every time I walked by it, I had the creepy feeling I was being stared at. Definitely felt the presence of something, or someone. I kind of felt stupid when we got home, felt I should have responded to it instead of running like a scaredy cat. Maybe they needed help, but at the same time, I'm glad I didn't. I could have brought something home with me, too. Ariel McIsaac Hello, everyone. This isn't necessarily scary scary, but it definitely was to us. A few years ago, the father of my children and I lived in Sturgeon Falls, Ontario. We had to go on a road trip to pick up his mom and stepfather, who wasn't doing very well at the time. He had cancer, and they were told he would be okay to make the trip. He fell very ill by the time they had reached Thunder Bay, so we had to go get them and bring them to their new home in Pembroke. We went and got them, and all went smoothly at first. But once we got there, he ended up in the hospital right away, and he passed on. When we were on our trip back to Sturgeon Falls, it was getting pretty late, so we had decided to get a hotel room in Deep River for the evening. As we walked into our room, something felt extremely off. The paintings around the room looked like the old time paintings where they would pose dead people and paint them. Super creepy. We couldn't even get a foot in the door without our hair standing up on the back of our necks. We didn't end up staying. We actually ended up leaving because it was really creepy. We made it to Mattawa where his dad lived and we spent the night there. Shortly after we arrived in Mattapan, we got a strange call from the person who was watching our place for us while we were gone. The hydro had been disconnected and someone had gone through our apartment. They stole everything we owned, including some very personal items. I'm not sure if it was our intuition kicking in 
just as we entered the hotel, but that whole night was very, very off. We ended up relocating to North Bay and visited his mom a few times after that. Another time traveling back, I was pregnant with my first child. I had fallen asleep in the car for a few moments, and apparently he did too. Everything would have been fine if he wasn't the one driving. Anyways, I woke up to an extremely bright light and a crash, and I was very disoriented. Somehow, we only managed to hit a pillin, but that never made sense to me. It was like 1 a.m., and we were in a rural area just driving through. I don't know where the light came from. It seems almost as if we crashed and jumped timelines somehow. Nick Schaefer. When I was a kid, somewhere around six or seven years old, my grandparents and I lived next door to an elderly woman who lived on her own. My grandmother always talked with her every day out in the garden since we had no back fence. It was one big backyard between her house and ours. My grandmother always went over to her house for coffee and say how she'd moved in if given the chance. Fast forward to that spring, uh, around late April, early May, and we get news that she has passed away in that house. My grandmother being the woman she is, we moved literally one house over. Now, here's where things get weird. For the first couple of months of being in there, we're clearing out the rest of her belongings out of the house and the garage. I'm in the garage by myself, digging through old photo albums and family photos of her and what I assumed were her children or grandchildren. And I hear something, or someone, call my name, followed by a noticeably colder breeze than the rest of the garage. It doesn't stop there. For the next few months in the summer, I keep hearing, like someone singing, but very quietly in the kitchen. It always sounded like an old lullaby, but I can't pin a name of it. I remember two instances that really stood out to me. The first being when I was in my room coloring and I'd feel a sense of being watched. Not a bad feeling, just like a calm feeling if that makes sense. The other time being that August when my grandmother asked me to go get her camera off of her desk. We were doing family photos. And so I turned it on out of curiosity and played around a little. I took it to the doorway of my grandma's room, the same room the woman passed away in. I should also add for context, my grandma kept the furniture the woman left behind. I aimed the camera at the mirror on top of the dresser, through the cracked door, and through the tiny screen on the camera. I could see what looked like a reflection of the woman sitting there. Her back was turned away from the camera, but from the angle I was at, it looked like she knew I was there because of the face staring at the camera from the reflection. Scared the hell out of me. For the next few years we lived there, there were always small things happening like footsteps in the middle of the night, lights being left on when we thought we turned them off. Sometimes things fell off the walls unexpectedly. We knew she was still there and just wanted to say hi. Amy Klimko. I was working at Walmart back in 2007 when they still had 10 items or less lines. It was my day to work that line with one other cashier. However, when one of us goes on break, there was no replacement. It was just one of us there. My coworker went on break and I had one in my line. Suddenly, here comes this woman with a cart crammed with stuff. She asks me in a frantic way, I know this is 10 items or less, but I am in a big hurry. Could you do me a huge favor and just check me out? 
It was true. The other lines were long, and being the nice person I am, I said yes. I was scanning and bagging like crazy because now my line was getting long. Finally, I am done, and she wants to pay by check. At that point, my printer broke, and I had to call my manager, who was tied up with another manager. While waiting, I was trying to find a way to fix it, and she started cussing me out calling me an idiot and all sorts of other bad names. I wanted to scream. I was nice and doing you a favor. It's not my fault. There's a problem with the printer. My manager came over and fixed it, and she called me incompetent to my manager. I told my manager what happened after she left, and my manager said, Ugh, what a bitch. The rest of my customers were cool about it and were telling me I was doing a great job. Needless to say, I put my two weeks notice in at the end of my shift. I am shocked I even lasted two months there. Don Holt You look so cute standing there wrapped in a towel. The moment I heard that voice on the phone, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I felt the shiver race down my spine. The person on the phone was my neighbor and my stalker. Allow me to take you back to when it all began. The year was 1989, and I had just graduated from high school. I was working in the food industry at the time, and I was looking for a way to move out of my parents' house. But, with minimum wage being what it was back then, the minimum was five fifteen an hour. So it wasn't easy for a young woman to afford a place on her own. Luckily for me, one of my best friends from high school was looking for a roommate. So, when she asked if I would like to split rent on the place, I immediately said yes. So, there we were. Two young women, fresh out of high school and ready to take on the world. We felt pretty grown up once we moved into our own place. My friend had found us a place in a trailer park, and if you know how trailer parks are set up, the homes are very close to one another. For the first year, everything went smoothly, save for a few bumps in the road, such as my longtime boyfriend and I broke up, and the nice neighbor that I had lived next to moved away. But, given those places were pretty cheap, it wasn't long before we had a new neighbor. His name was Terry, and he was a few years older than me and my friend. And, right from the start, he gave me a creeper type of vibe. He always looked at us as if he were trying to imagine what we look like naked. I was cordial enough to him, since we were neighbors, and it would do us well to try to get along. But little did I know how my friendly nature would be misconstrued. Now, I'd recently begun dating someone new, but my roommate didn't know since I hadn't told anyone just yet. She was away on weekends with her then-boyfriend, so she hadn't met him yet. I had no idea that she'd given our number to our neighbor, until the late night phone calls began. They started with just heavy breathing, but then they graduated to very lewd comments that I won't go into. Let's just say that they would have made a sailor blush. At first, I tried to ignore it, chalking it up to the fact that he was always drunk when he called me. But after the night that he called and mentioned my being wrapped in a towel, I freaked out. Terry described everything that I'd been doing that day, from the time that I woke up to the time that he called. I was all alone in that trailer, and my folks were off on a couple's trip. My roommate was off with her boyfriend in another city, so the only person that I could call at that time was my new boyfriend. When I told him what was going on, he immediately called his aunt, and they came to get me and I stayed with them over the weekend. After that night, the calls continued, 
and he was becoming unhinged, proclaiming that God had told him that the two of us were meant to be together, and how God would be angry if I ignored his calling. He claimed that God told him that we were to marry, have four children, and that he would see to it that I became his, no matter what he had to do in order to make me his. Sadly, there weren't any anti-stalking laws back then, so calling the police wouldn't have helped. Well, call it luck, but not too long after that, I got fired, which meant that I couldn't make my rent any longer. And at that same time, I found out that I was pregnant, so I had to move home for a little while. Several months later, and my now husband and I moved into an efficiency. And who should I run into but Terry? I felt my heart drop the moment that I saw him. Our eyes met and he smirked at me, licking his lips as he checked me out. Now, let me remind you that I was five months pregnant, so it was quite obvious, but that didn't seem to matter to him. I begged and pleaded with my husband to move immediately. When he asked why, I told him that Terry was the man who had stalked me all those months ago. So we found a new place and moved as fast as we could. After that day, I thankfully never saw him again. So creepy stalker Terry, I hope that we never meet ever again. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these true subscriber horror stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the channel, because without you, there wouldn't be a Back to Ashes. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.